You're listening to the Transform Your Life from the Inside Out podcast. This episode is titled, The Power of Synchronicity and Intention. Let me ask you, have you ever really thought about that? Have you ever thought about how powerful you are and can be when you harness the power of synchronicity and intention? Keep listening. Okay, so this episode we're talking about synchronicity and intention. And you're extraordinarily powerful, very powerful, just by virtue of being born onto this planet. You know, it's so hard for us to grasp, and a lot of people really, they can think about it conceptually, but really can't integrate the thought. But you're a part of everything on this planet, and you're a representation of the cosmos. Now, I know that sounds very woo-woo and new agey and everything else, but that is the truth. When you look at your chemical structure and your body and your, your bones and your skin and, and everything in your body, I'm going to segue here for a second. As people always talk about science and technology, you want to know the greatest technology on the planet. That's your body. I mean, for crying out loud, do you know how to separate salt when you eat salt, do you know how to separate it out of your out of your food so your body can process it? No, but your body knows how to do it because it's it's the most advanced what I call technology on the planet. Okay, so anyway, let's go back here. You're extremely powerful, but most of us are at the mercy of our 3D reality, meaning the physical world around us. You know, things that we can see and touch and smell and taste, the five physical senses. And most of us live there. And candidly, if you're not creating what you want in life, it's because you're living stuck in your 3D reality and your persistence of your 3D reality, which this model is called the Newtonian Cartesian model of the world. And that was updated a couple a couple hundred years later by the Einsteinian model and the quantum physics model of the world. You know, according to quantum physics, you're simply particles and waves. You're both. Anyway, let's go back here to synchronicity. And the definition of synchronicity is the simultaneous occurrence of events which appear significantly related but have no discernible casual connection. That means that something happens, but you can't actually figure out, you know, where's the point A to the point B? I mean, what's the connection between A and B? But they're related somewhere, and they're related in consciousness. So what I want to do in this episode, and by the way, backtracking here a second, is I don't know where I'm going to go with the podcast. I don't know if I'm going to start having guests or whatever, but candidly, these episodes generally are a lot of work. Because I have to think about, for example, I'm working on two episodes right now, and I worked on one for three hours last night, thinking about how do I take this very huge concept and distill it down so that people can listen to it in 30 minutes and get their takeaway from it. And I'm thinking, do I really want to work that hard for something that I'm putting out there, you know, right now? That's it. Anyway, I don't know where the podcast is going to go. But anyway, this episode, a couple of minutes, well, today, I was like, okay, got to do the podcast tonight. And I just picked up some notes on my desk because I have a whole stack right here on my desk. And I just picked up some notes. And the first note I had scribbled, I had intention and synchronicity. And I want to share some personal stories with you that these are concepts that I, I know. I don't just understand, you know, analytically and intellectually and you know, just the grammar and all the, you know, it's just words. I know these stories and I know these concepts. And let me share these stories with you. Many years ago, many years ago, it was probably, I'm thinking here in 1991 or, or so. Now in college, I graduated with a dual major. I have a degree in political science and a degree in psychology. And out of college, I said, I really want to work in politics, but not so much politics as humanitarian politics. And I do the same thing now doing the podcast, but it's not in political clothing. 
it's more along the lines of the advancement of humanity. And I really wanted to work and be at the Carter Presidential Center. So let's start the synchronicity there and the intention there. So I remember when I, I, I lived in Houston, Texas in the early 1990s. And I knew that I was going to move to Atlanta. And I told one of my best friends, I said, I'm moving to Atlanta. And when I move to Atlanta, I'm going to work at the Carter Presidential Center. And I'm going to work, you know, in the, in the executive offices of Jimmy Carter. Now, what a lot of people don't know is people that are only politically oriented only talk about politics and that he wasn't the great American president. Well, I'm going to maybe allude to that in a minute because I know what happened on the inside, so to speak, through observation. Anyway, I said, Chris, I'm going to move to Atlanta and I'm going to work at the Carter Presidential Center. And Chris said, Jim, don't you think a lot of people want to work at the Carter Presidential Center? And I said, yes, I'm sure a lot of people do, but I'm going to. Now listen to that voice tone and inflection. I am going to. Now let me pull some synchronicity into this. At that time, I had quit my, let's call it, I mean, I, I was college educated. I had along the lines of a corporate job. I quit that job and I was waiting tables at a place called Dave and Buster's in Houston. And that factors into the story a little bit because when I was waiting tables at Dave and Buster's in Houston, I said, you know, when I move to Atlanta, I'm not going to have a job. I mean, my folks live there, I'll have a place to live, but I won't have a job. So what I did is I actually quit my job at Dave and Buster's, packed everything I had in my car that literally cost me a thousand dollars. And I'm surprised that it made it to Atlanta. And when I was younger, I used to work out like a fiend. I mean, I would go to the gym five days a week and I got there like on a Tuesday or Wednesday. And the very next day I hopped in the car and I went south to a, a town north of Atlanta. It's a suburb called Marietta. And I just intu intuitively, seriously, intuitively, I just said, okay, turn left here. And I turned left and there was a health club and it was a nice one, a uh, very upscale health club. And I went in and I joined that day and I worked out that day. When I left the health, the health club, I said, okay, I've got to get a job. And right now, easy money, easy job is waiting tables. So literally up, up the block from the health club and it was called the Windy Hill Athletic Club. I don't know if it's still there or not, but it was a really upscale club and a nice part of town. And I went about a block up and there was a place called Lever Rocks Seafood House. And I pulled in and I went in after lunch because if you wait at tables or, you know, you've been a server, you know that never go in at lunch because they're busy and they don't, they don't want to talk to you. So I walked in at about two o'clock and I asked for an application and I filled out the application and I said, can I talk to the manager, please? Now, mind you, I just said that I, I had come from Dave and Buster's in Houston, Texas. So the manager comes out. He looks at my application and he says hi and everything, but he looks at my application and he doesn't say anything. He just kind of peruses, you know, kind of looks over my application. And he said, I see here that you worked at Dave and Buster's in Houston. And he said, who hired you? And I said, oh, Chuck Karothhammer. And he said, oh, okay, if Chuck will hire you, I will hire you. And I said, what? And he goes, yeah. He goes, Chuck was, I was the best man in Chuck's wedding. And if he hires you and hired you, I will hire you. And look at that synchronicity. I leave Dave and Buster's from Houston. I go to Atlanta, 800 miles away. I inadvertently take a left turn. I inadvertently walk into this restaurant haphazardly. I apply for a job and the manager who looked at my application and there were four managers working that, that restaurant, but he's the one who looked at it and his friend was Chuck who hired me 800 miles away. Okay. Now the story takes a little more of a twist. Now, mind you, I said I wanted to work at the Carter Presidential Center and I knew that I wanted to work there, but I also kind of had a backup plan and I was a kid. I, you know, I just like, I was thinking, okay, well, you know, Coke is a big brand. I want to work at Coca-Cola or the Carter Presidential Center. But I had my heart set on the Carter Presidential Center. Now, when you wait tables, anyone who, who does, you know, waits tables knows this, that many times if you're a kid, you know, out of college or thereabouts, 
people will say, what did you major in? Where are you going to school? What are you going to do with your, you know, people chat with you and especially people that are, you know, a little older, not the kids, but excuse me, people in their thirties, forties and fifties, et cetera. They'll chat with you. And so there was this lady that I met and I said, I want to work at the Carter center, presidential center or Coca-Cola. And she said to me, she goes, Oh, I know some people like Coke. Those were her exact words. I know some people like Coca-Cola. And she goes, I'm going to come in on Saturday. I'm going to have a private party. I want you to wait on the party and bring me your resume. And so, you know, I brought my resume and I waited on the party Saturday night. On Monday morning at 9 a.m., I got a phone call from the International Director of Human Resources at Coca-Cola. What the hell? And I started thinking, I was a, I mean, I was, I was a kid. I didn't know any differently to ask intelligent questions and everything. So I'm talking to the international director of HR. And I said, and the lady said, she goes, Mrs. Poole gave me your resume. She brought it down to me personally and wanted me to call you. And like I said, I was a kid. I didn't know any differently. And I said, well, what does Mrs. Poole do at Coca-Cola? And she goes, you don't know. And I said, no, I, I don't know. And she goes, she is the personal assistant to the chairman of the board, Roberto Casueda. Wow. And actually, I say, well, more foolishly, because I didn't even know she was a personal assistant to the chairman of the board. But how does that happen when I just say I'm going to work here or I'm going to work there? Okay, let's fast forward a little bit. Now, in the restaurant, as I said, people will always ask you questions. And this one lady that I, I, she and I talked a lot, she and her husband would come in and they would ask for me. When you wait tables, you know, that's called the call party when people ask for you. And we started chatting about a lot of different things. And I said, you know, I really want to work at the Carter Presidential Center. And she goes, you need to meet my boss. And I said, well, who's your boss? And she, she said, Max Cleland. And I kind of heard the name, but I'm like, who's Max Cleland? And she goes, he is the Secretary of State of Georgia. Now, I did a little research, and what I found was he was the most popular elected official in the, in the state. And she goes, I want you to meet Max. So she set up an appointment. She took me to meet Max. And the very first time I met him, he said, Jim, you know, Ann brought you in here, so she must like you. If Zell, who was the current governor, if he doesn't run for governor, I'm going to run. And chances are, because he was so popular, he would have won. And he goes, I need a driver Do you, because he lost an arm in both of his legs in Vietnam. And he goes, I need a driver. Do you want to drive me across the state of Georgia while I'm campaigning for governor? And I said, you know, thank you, you know, Mr. Secretary. That sounds really good. But I really want to work at the Carter Presidential Center. And he said, Jimmy, I've known Jimmy for, for 25 years. And he said, Jimmy appointed me the, I think the, 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 whatever the department chair or head or whatever of the, of the department of veteran affairs. He goes, let me make a phone call for you. A couple of days later, I was interviewing at the Carter presidential center. Now, initially as a volunteer, but I was, I was interviewing there and within a week I was actually volunteering, but in the executive offices with the opportunity to be hired in the or at the executive offices of the Carter Presidential Center. And when the job that I wanted came open, I started interviewing for the job and I didn't get it. It was assistant to President Carter's chief of staff. And I was kind of bummed out back then. But a good friend of mine said, Jim, if you get the job, that's great. And if you don't get it, that's great. I'm like, what do you mean by that? And he said, if you get the job, it's meant for you. And if you don't get the job, then it's not meant for you. I didn't get the job and who knows where I'd be today, but by not getting that job, it sent me on a completely different trajectory that took me to New York city. That took me to the hypnosis Institute. That took me to all the things that I do now and the mind work that I do from not getting that job. But the example here and what I'm sharing with you, the synchronicity, all that I simply said was I am going to work at the Carter presidential center. And even though my friend Chris was trying to say, you know, Jim, be realistic, be real. I knew there's the operative word here's and, and, and please pay attention here. I knew what I wanted. I knew what I wanted. 
and I could feel it in my bones. And as a result of that, I didn't know it at that time, but the universe was already setting up the synchronicity for me because I had my intention on what it is that I wanted to create. And because I had my, my intention on it, how in the hell do you think the universe opened up me moving from, from Houston, Texas to, to, to Atlanta, 800 miles apart, millions of people in both cities. And I happened to work into a rest, walk into a restaurant where the manager is, was like best buddies with the manager of my prior, you know, job 800 miles away. How does that happen? The universe opened doors for me. Let me share another story with you is when I lived in New York city, I first moved there for my first year and I lived on the upper East side. It's a very wealthy section of Manhattan and it's also very boring. Uh, my friends used to call it a white bread because it's just that boring. There's no flavor. It's rich people on the Upper East Side and that's it. There's no homeless people. There's no flavor. There's no, there's no like flavor like you get in the East Village or the West Village or Soho or different parts of Manhattan. It's just the Upper East Side. Boring. But I lived there my first year. And I said, I want to move to the west side next year when my lease is up. I want to live on the Upper West Side. And then I said, you know what? I don't want to just live on the west side. I want to live at 72nd and Broadway. And the reason why is, number one, it's one of the biggest intersections in, in Manhattan. I mean, 72nd and Broadway is a huge intersection in Manhattan. But the main reason was is that I went to Central Park every Saturday to what's called the Sheep Meadow. And it's where everyone hangs out in the park, at least in that part of the park. And it's right next to where John Lennon lived. Maybe John Lennon's ghost was there. I don't know. But that's for reference. It was at 72nd and Central Park West where you would enter the sheep meadow. But I knew if I lived at 72nd, I could just walk right there. And I had a dog. So I knew it'd be an easy walk there. And I really wanted to live in that, that location. So as I said, I spent like a lot of New Yorkers, I spent every Saturday and Sunday in the park. That's our backyard when you live in Manhattan. And one day I was meeting a friend of mine, another friend named Chris. Interesting, I didn't think about that until just now. Another friend named Chris. And we, we said, where are we going to meet? We're going to meet at 72nd and Broadway and we'll walk to the park. We'll grab some lunch, walk to the park. And when I was standing at 72nd and Broadway, I said, wow, holy cow, it's loud here. Now, mind you, it's a busy intersection. It's loud. I give you my word, this is what I said. I said, you know what? I don't want to live at 72nd and Broadway. I'm going to live at 73rd and Broadway. Now, let me share a story with you here. Something I don't say a lot in this podcast, and I may go a different direction. I may go to even a more profound and dear, uh, you know, deeper spiritual place, and especially after having a stroke last year. I don't know. We'll see. But I can hear. I'm clear audience. I can hear and I can hear, I'll just tell you, his name is Don Juan. He's not on the planet anymore, but I can hear him. And so one day I was eating lunch and Don Juan says, go to a roommate service. And I said, which is what everyone did or does in New York, did in New York city, because so many people have roommates because it's so expensive. And if you're young, it's hard to, to, meet, to make ends meet. And so I heard Don Juan say, go to a roommate service. And I said, I don't want to go to a roommate service. And he said to me, I told you to go to a roommate service. I said, I don't want to go to a roommate service. I'm hungry. I want a sandwich. And he said, get up now and go. And I did. So I, I knew where I was going to go. I went down to one. And when I went into um, say, Hey guys, I'm looking to, you know, find a roommate. I don't know how long I'm going to be in Manhattan or I'd my own place. So when I went in, they said, you know, Jim, we don't have what you're looking for right now, but we'll, you know, we'll keep you in mind when I got home. So I took the, the subway back home. I got home and the blinking light on my answering machine. Yes. We had answering machines back then. We, I wasn't using a cell phone was blinking. And I listened to the message and they said, Jim, Five minutes after you walked out, 
someone walked in and they have seemingly exactly what you're looking for. Now, my criteria in my mind was I have a roommate that has some kind of spiritual orientation. So at least there would be some peace and calm in the apartment. I wanted to live on 73rd Street. I wanted my own bedroom, my own bathroom, which is a big deal in Manhattan. I wanted, this was a big obstacle, I thought. I wanted a roommate that was dog friendly. I had a black lab. I had her for 15 years and she was three years old at that point. And I ain't going anywhere without my dog or my dogs now. And so a roommate that liked dogs and I wanted my rent to be the same as it was on the Upper East Side. So they said, hey, this person walked in, give him a call. He looks like, you know, he's got what you're looking for, where you're looking for. I called the guy. I was the first person to call. He goes, I want to interview other people, obviously. And then I had to take my dog over so he could meet my dog. Understandably, I mean, people want to know what's going to be in their house, in their apartment. And anyway, at the end of all this, he said, I picked you. And funny enough, I said, how come me? Out of all these people that you've met with, how come me? And he said, you know what? You seem like you'll be, a good, you'll be a good roommate. You can pay your bills. And I like your dog. Now, here's the thing. Is I had my own bedroom. I had my own bathroom. There was a roomy poetry book on the credenza when I walked in. And he was, you know, kind of spiritual or accepting or just kind of of that, you know, spiritual orientation. And so I had my own bedroom, my own bathroom. He's kind of spiritual. My rent was 78 cents more than what it was in my prior address that I moved away from. My address, 170 West 73rd Street. Yeah, 170 West 73rd Street, New York, New York, 10021. How does that happen? How do I walk and say, this is where I know I want to live on 73rd Street? And boom, it happens. That is the power of intention and synchronicity where things, the synchronicity went, went out to the roommate service and someone else walked in unseemingly related to me, not knowing me. And they walk in. Why? Because the synchronicity is following my power of intention. Two short stories. My good friend, Tommy, uh, we waited tables together at a place called Chops in Atlanta back in the early 90s. And he was out of law school and he said, Jim, I want to work at that law firm. Uh, once I stop waiting tables, pass the bar, all that. And he goes, I want to work at that firm, but I like that building. Now, I was already learning all this back then. Even before I met my brother-in-law, Don Javier, the shaman, I was already on air quote, the path. I said, Tommy, because this is what I did for the apartment. I wrote it down. I said, write it down and detail it. Now, Tommy is a very rational, practical 3D world kind of guy. I mean, he's very analytical. He's an attorney and he's very analytical. And he's like, Jim, that's a bunch of mumbo jumbo horse crap. And I said, Tommy, just trust me. So we, I stopped waiting tables, whatever, before he did. And I took another corporate job for a bit, a whole different story. And he called me and goes, you're not going to believe this. And he said, you, you remember that building that you, I told you about and you told me to write it down? And I said, yes. He goes, I got an offer from a law firm in that building. Synchronicity and intention. Many years ago, 19, that was 2001. I had a really good fraternity brother in college. One of my fraternity brothers I connected with, we were like spiritual brothers. We, after college, we backpacked across Mexico, which is where he moved to. Uh, and he taught English in Mexico City. We backpacked all across Mexico in the mid 90s. And in 2001, I had lost touch with him. And we were like very connected in college and after co college. And in 19, no, I'm sorry, 2001, I'm thinking of years here because it's kind of important, at least to me on my storyline. And I said, I wonder what Chris is doing. One day, I hadn't seen Chris in about five years. And I said, I wonder what Chris is doing. And I said, I am going to reconnect with Chris. Is what, I, geez, I just recognized another Chris. Oh my gosh, I just recognized three Chris's in a row. Okay, seriously, I just got that after all these years. Chris, again. So Chris Watts, Chris Adams, and Chris Hett. And wow, mind-blowing. 
and in this episode together also, Synchronicity. So I said, I wonder what Chris is doing. And I'm going to find Chris. And that was it. The very next day, I got an email from a friend of mine who owned a company in Italy, in Milan, Italy. I used to go to Milan, Italy to speak at his company. And he said, hey, Jim, this email came today, or this email came yesterday, which was the day that I was looking for Chris. This email came for you. And the email basically was Chris looking for me. And he found me online with my name at that company. And he emailed the company in Italy and they know me and they forwarded the email to me. The point is, is when I was looking for him and I set my intention to find him and reconnect that very same day in his mind, he was writing an email connecting with me. How does all of this happen? And it doesn't just happen to me. It happens to all of us because we're all in this cosmic soup called consciousness and your thoughts are consciousness and what you think literally what you hold in your emotional intention, meaning you can feel it and what you hold there is what the universe starts organizing around and it organizes around it and it creates it for you. Now, I know some of the science-minded people, et cetera, will say, well, Jim, that's a bunch of crap. Science doesn't even recognize how broken it is because the reality is there is a physics experiment called the double slit experiment. And in that experiment, what physicists recognized is that the outcome of the experiment was contingent upon the expectations of the people conducting the experiment. Which means the experiment, the research was affected by the thoughts of the people conducting the research. So when science has this scientific method, that is 3D static. It's brick and mortar. It's hard. It's con concrete. It's firm. But yet, in truth, science and their scientific method is working hundreds of years behind quantum physics. And even quantum physics proves that through the double slit experiment. Believe don't believe entirely up to you. But the question is, is what do you have to lose by exploring this? So the question that I have for you, and then I'm going to dig a little deeper is what do you want? The truth is this doing this for a lot of years is most people can't tell me what they want. They can tell me what they do want, but they can't tell me, I'm mean, sorry. They can tell me what they don't want, but they can't tell me what they do want. And if you don't know what you want, the universe gives you more of that chaos of not knowing and that uncertainty of not knowing what you want. So I'm going to go one step further here and we will wrap up this episode. Before I do, if you would, please, I'm going to ask again, if you would, please, a little reciprocity. I put a lot of work into these episodes, a little Aini, meaning reciprocity back please share these episodes with your friends and family and people you think will find value. If you find value, other people find value. There are millions of downloads um, of, my, of my podcast. That means there is value. So the request that I'm making is some reciprocity back from you. You find value, then share to create more value for me so that I can reach more people. Okay, so I ask you what you wanted, but I'm going to segue here. Stop wanting anything. I work from a phrase. It's a very powerful phrase. To want nothing is to have everything. When you want something, look at the consciousness in that. When you want something, you're telling the universe, I don't have it. That's what you're telegraphing unconsciously and energetically to the universe. And when the universe says, okay, we're reading that, you know, those electromagnetics and you're saying you don't have it, therefore the universe is going to give you not any more of it. Why? Because you don't have it. So the mistake, the error, the shooting ourselves in the foot that most of us make is wanting, 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 wanting. And especially have you ever noticed that people that have the least amount of money need the money the most and they want it the most and yet they have the least? Why? Because when you want something, you repel it. Think about that. When you want something, when you need something, you repel it. That's why my brother-in-law taught me a phrase I love. 
and it might take you some time to get your mind around this, but that phrase is, a spiritual person needs nothing from no one. Ponder that. Why? Because a spiritual person knows that divine mind, that source, the universe, is the source of their abundance and their flow and their needs, not other people. It simply comes through other people as a conduit from the universe because we're all conduits for consciousness. So here is the final takeaway this week is what do you intend for your life? Think about that. What do you intend for your life? I intended to work at the Carter Presidential Center. I intended to perhaps work at Coke. Look what showed up. I intended to live on the Upper West Side on 73rd Street. My address is 170 West 73rd Street. I intended it. Don Javier, and again, he's not the Don Javier on YouTube. He's my brother-in-law. His name is Javier. I call him Don. People that work with him out of respect, uh, Don Javier. He said... He, about 10, 15 years ago, he's like, please get it. And he goes, what I mean by that is most of humanity still works in what they think is the third dimension. But in terms of physics, we are literally working in the fifth dimension. The third dimension is all labor and roll up your sleeves and you have to make something happen. And the fifth dimension, it's simply holding your intention firmly and emotionally on the outcomes that you know you're going to create. And that's what people say. Basically, that's what I call trusting the universe. So what do you intend for your life? And now I already know you've had examples of this showing up in your life. I know you have. You've had these synchronicities. So if they've they've happened before, why can't they happen again? St. Germain once said, well, I don't know how many times he said it. Could have said it every day. Could have had a tattoo. I don't know. But St. Germain said, when humans understand how the universe works, they will cease to believe in miracles. Thanks for listening, and I'll catch you on the next episode. Bye-bye.